G'day, my name's Chris Nixon, and I've been asked to answer the question, why foam? But it's not going to be a one-eyed look at the foam world. We're going to talk about the facts, the fallacies, and the foibles. Firstly, I should start with some disclosures. These are the website or foam ventures that I've involved in. There's lifeinthefarsane.com. This is Smack Gold Conference, which will be running out of the Gold Coast in Australia in March 2014. There's the iteachem.net website, which uh, I do with Rob Rogers and Mike Cadigan, which focuses on educators and clinical medicine. And then there's Infomatica, which is a website that hopefully will soon bring foam to everyone in the easiest way possible. So what is foam? It's free open access education. As such, it's a dynamic collection of tools and resources, but it's become much more than these. It's also a community and an ethos. Let me explain, starting with the facts. Foam resources are independent of platform or media. They include blogs, podcasts, tweets, Google Hangouts, web-based applications, online videos, text documents, photographs, drawings, graphics, even anything you can create with good old-fashioned pen and paper can be used to create foam. The unifying characteristics of foam resources are that they're willingly shared for use and reuse and are free and available to anyone. Now, the foam community has sometimes been accused of being a bit like a cult, so it's only fitting that we have our own creation myth. And uh, the term foam may seem like a bit of a banal acronym, but it's amazing how important the names of things are when it comes to making ideas stick and making ideas spread. So my life in the Farsane colleague Mike Cadigan with his uh, good friend, emergency physician Sean Rothwell, were in Dublin for the ISIM conference in 2012. And uh, as usual, Mike was lamenting the fact that he had to give another talk on social media. Two words that are like kryptonite to doctors. They make them run away. And he was trying to figure out a way of trying to sell the whole social media idea to a medical audience. And he found the answer at the bottom of a pint of Guinness. And that's when foam bubbled into existence. The reason why I call this a creation myth is not because it didn't happen, but it's not really where foam started. Foam existed long before the acronym became into being. Um, we certainly had the foam ethos at the forefront of our minds when we were started work on life in the fast lane over five years ago. But as Joe Lex pointed out at the SMAC conference um, in March 2013, the origins of foam probably lie in the Hippocratic Oath itself. If you take out the misogynistic bits and all the nepotism, you're pretty much left with this. And to teach them this art, if they desire to learn it, without fee and covenant. That sounds like foam to me. And then if we look back to another legend in the world of medical education, there is Sir William Osler himself, who formed the first formalised journal club in Canada in 1875. And his original purpose of this journal club was for the purchase and distribution of periodicals to which he could ill afford to subscribe. And so indeed, even William Osler was a progenitor of the foam movement. And let's face it, throughout the history of our medical profession, we've always been willing to share knowledge with others committed to our craft and to seek learning from far-flung places, from whoever is in a position to provide it. And in the age of social media, this has never been easier. Indeed, since Dublin, foam has literally exploded and it's growing rampantly. Today, there are over 230 blogs committed to foam in the emergency medicine and critical care arena. And that's in 24 countries in over six languages. But then there's also numerous other resources that you could consider foam, but don't explicitly embrace the label. These are some of my favorite resources from the critical care arm of foam. There's palmccm.org and Critical Care Reviews, which are both great resources for keeping up with the literature and in intensive care. Uh, CritIQ has a free blog and also creates some great video resources. There's, of course, the SMAC uh, podcast. All of the talks that were given at SMAC are being released free online. And then there's a the big daddy of them all, Scott Weingart's MCrit podcast. Joe Lex has his free emergency medicine talks website where he's uploaded talks from conferences all around the world. 
that can be downloaded for free. The Intensive Care Network comes out of Sydney. There's a Maryland critical care project and Cliff Reed, a Sydney HEMS doctor, provides updates on some of the breaking literature in the field of resuscitation on resus.me. And then, of course, there's uh, Matt and Mike who have their wacky and original ultrasound podcast. Focusing more on the emergency medicine sphere, there's also numerous other great resources and it's hard to pick out just a few favourites. It's also, this is such a dynamic area that new websites are popping up all the time. But these would be some of my favourites at the moment. The Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine, mpem.org for paediatrics and don't forget the bubbles as well. Then there's Boring EM, which focuses on and on the less exciting areas of emergency medicine, which is a niche that, that was just waiting to be filled. There's Rob Orman's ERcast.org, where he talks to mostly people from other specialties to gain insights into conditions that we need to treat in emergency medicine. David Newman's Smart EM takes the deep dives and really delves into the medical literature, as does EM Nerd in written format. Ryan Radecki reviews emergency medicine literature of note, and perhaps the biggest emergency medicine blog around at the moment is Academic Life in Emergency Medicine, which if you haven't seen, you really need to go and check out. And probably the UK equivalent of that is uh, St. Emlyn's, run by or led by Simon Carley. Then if you're into pre-hospital and retrieval medicine, you want to check out Min Lee Kong's farm blog coming out of uh, the Australian outback. The growth of all these resources has just been amazing. And for instance, if we look at what's happening with life in the fastlane.com, uh, now we're getting over 30,000 page views daily. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. It's also getting harder and harder to ignore. And if you do ignore it, your students are going to leave you behind. So those are the facts about foam. Now let's move on and address some of the fallacies. So one of the first fallacies is that foam is sometimes considered synonymous with educational social media for medicine. But foam is much more than just social media. Social media refers to the creation and exchange of user-generated content via virtual networks and communities using internet applications. And certainly social media has been a potent catalyst for developing and disseminating foam resources. But it's from the sharing of these resources that has grown a lively global community of foam users and creators. And this foam community is bound by the loosely woven philosophy that high quality medical education resources and interactions can and should be both free and accessible to all those that help people who are suffering from illness and especially those that teach others. Importantly, People who subscribe to the FOAM ideals encourage the reuse and modification of their resources to suit user requirements and local needs. And ultimately, the glue that holds this community together is an ethos of open sharing, collaboration, as well as attribution and recognition of the work of others. The next fallacy is about Twitter, because it turns out that Twitter has been central to the development of the FOAM community, which may be surprising because I like many of you when I first encountered Twitter, found it hard to believe how this could ever be useful. It seemed to be mostly about figuring out what Justin Bieber had just had for breakfast. Of course, we do have our own Justin Bieber equivalent in Scott Weingart from the MCRIT podcast. But the reason why Twitter is so great is that it's free to use and it allows users to selectively follow anyone who has something interesting or useful to share. The fact that tweets are limited to just 140 characters seems like a curse, but this forced brevity actually ensures that users must cut to the chase and get their points across in a concise and clear fashion. It also makes it ideal for just sharing links and other resources. Furthermore, Twitter users can also follow topics rather than individuals if tweets are labelled with a hashtag. For instance, foam tweets can be labelled hashtag foam med, not hashtag foam, that leads to a different sort of an education. And now we're seeing subspecialty hashtags like hashtag foam CC and conferences like the SMAC Gold Conference have their own hashtags as well. This is a slide showing how the first SMAC conference went on Twitter. So you, although there were about 700 people physically at the conference, there were over double that number actually engaged in, with the conference hashtag on Twitter. 
This generated over 15,000 tweets and there were over 18 million impressions, which essentially is the number of times the hashtag appears in somebody's Twitter feed. That translates into a huge reach. The next fallacy I'd like to address is the lack of peer review in FOAM. FOAM is not scientific research. FOAM is just a useful way of disseminating, discussing, dissecting, and deliberating over the products of that research, as well as exploring issues where research findings simply do not apply or do not exist. So whereas peer review, I think, is useful for scientific research, in FOAM, it's less useful because we have a publish then filter model. And in FOAM, opinions and arguments live or die by being hammered on the anvil of truth that anvil being free and open debate and discussion. Indeed, FOAM is becoming part of the post-publication peer review process. We're starting to see blog posts that raise issues with journals and lead to corrections, as happened on the, the Intensive Care Network recently. And there's a number of blogs, such as Emergency Medicine Literature of Note and EM Nerd, that are dedicated to in-depth critical appraisal and discussion of the scientific literature, not to mention uh, podcasts such as The Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine and Smart EM. Another way that foam meshes in with journals is that we know that knowledge translation continues to be difficult to achieve in medicine, and there remains a significant research practice gap. Having seen the impact of, for instance, Twitter with the SMAC conference, you can see that there's a really potent potential for social media and foam to play and improving the dissemination and translation of knowledge. Another fallacy is that foam, with its anarchic origins, is in somehow in competition with established medical education. Again, I see it more as an adjunct. One of the ways that foam ties in with people, say, working in emergency medicine and critical care, who are often doing shift work, is that these resources are ideal for asynchronous learning. Asynchronous learning allows trainees to educate themselves using resources that suit their needs at times that suit them. This model is also well suited to trainees who are isolated or in remote locations distant from specialist clinical educators. FOAM and asynchronous learning also ties in well with the idea of the flipped classroom. Instead of using dedicated teaching time devoted to lectures that could be easily disseminated as a video or as readings beforehand, you can dedicate your teaching time to facilitated discussion, simulation, as well as other interactive and team-based learning approaches that actually need people to be together as a group rather than things that they can do by themselves just as well. These resources also tie in with the idea of just-in-time learning. You can easily access the stuff when you need it. And foam is also a great way of sharing tacit knowledge. So many of the things that we do in medicine aren't easily learnt from a book. They're more easily learnt by modelling on other people or by repeated discussion and exploration of the topic over time. And this is where foam is really ideal. So now that we've addressed some of the major fallacies, let's move on to the foibles, which means the weaknesses and eccentricities of foam. Well, first of all, is that there's nothing that replaces the bedside mentor. Foam is simply an adjunct to learning. We need clinical teachers to model behavior, guide us at the bedside, and help us interpret information we've obtained, whether that be from foam or another source. Information overload also remains a significant barrier to people becoming engaged with foam. People worry about the noise swallowing up the signal. We've had to deal with information overload since the invention of the Gutenberg Press. There's always been more information out there than what we can take in. And what information overload really is, is filter failure. Because what we need to do is find effective filters to pass on the signal and cut away the noise. And if you do this effectively, you'll find that it's not that you don't have time to use social media, it's that you don't have time not to use it. Another weakness of foam is that it does vary in quality, and it varies in objectives. Some of foam is essentially the equivalent of a corridor conversation, whereas others has the scholarship equivalent of anything published in a medical journal. Wherever we get our information from, we have to think critically about it and appraise it according to its own intrinsic worth. Even information from authorities can turn out to be wrong. Indeed, the variable degree of scholarship is a valid criticism of foam resources. 
and I hope to see that foam creators in the future strive to produce referenced scholarly works wherever possible. This will enhance their own credibility and will also help users make up their own minds about the worth of the information that they're getting. Another foible concerns social media and professionalism. The problem is that a jackass in the real world will be an even bigger jackass online. When we're using social media, it's the equivalent of shouting through a megaphone to a football stadium packed with people. We have to remember that the rules of professionalism that apply in our day-to-day -day practice apply just the same in the social media world. We, first and foremost, we have to protect our patients. Another concern with the foam movement is that although this stuff is free to use, it's not really free to create. And thus far, it's depending on the goodwill of enthusiastic creators. But I think this will continue to be the case because the secondary gains are enormous in terms of the opportunities that it creates, whether that be professional advancement, the opportunity to collaborate with others, or to speak at conferences in different parts of the world. And the bottom line is that if you're an educator, there's no greater reward than seeing more and more people learn from the things that you've created. So I'm going to leave you with a choice. I want you to decide that getting involved in foam is a good thing, and you can do it in a big way or a little way. If you're just starting out, I suggest checking out the Litful Review, which comes out weekly on lifeinthefastlane.com. It's a summary of what we think are the best foam resources to come out in the past week. It'll only take you 10 minutes to go over it, and that's an instant introduction to the foam world. If you want to search for foam resources, check out googlefoam.com. And if you want some tips to, for how to get started, check out 10 Tips for Foam Beginners on iteachem.net. And the next thing I'd like you to keep an eye open for is informatica.org. This again is another brainchild of Mike Cadogan, and it promises to be like the Facebook or YouTube of medical education, where people can go on and share educational resources with one another and reuse them to their heart's content. And finally, if you're still wavering about whether you should get involved in foam, I want to stress to you that we have a moral imperative to make sure that no one is wrong on the internet. Conversations are happening on the streets and the medical wards and in chat rooms on the internet. We need as many smart, intelligent and informed people to get involved in these conversations so that misinformation doesn't spread. And let's face it, it's up to us to save the world. And I believe that getting involved in foam is one small step to helping to achieve that goal. Thank you very much.